Hey everybody, uh, sorry for the little delay. Um, my name is Alex Ponsky and I help uh, run the Knox Data Group. Um, and so uh, basically you're in machine learning, data science, kind of overboard kind of place. Um, and so today is actually going to talk about uh, deep reinforcement learning, which is really kind of cool. Um, so one of the things that we did, we've done recently, kind of dive into a little bit, I just want to give us a quick shout out to um, the city of Knoxville last year developed an open data initiative. Um, but basically, a year has gone by, and they're kind of still trying to figure out the process of what open data really means and how people might get involved. So uh, some of you who weren't with us, we had uh, there was a quarterly that happened uh, last month for our mothership, Knox Devs, and the mayor came out and uh, talked a little bit about kind of what, what's important about open data, uh, as well as people from the city themselves. So we actually had a quick like pop-up uh, brainstorms and, and, and brews last Friday at um, Beer and Beer Market, and that produced some really cool, interesting results um, of some ideas that people had, and kind of some ideas for kind of where we can move forward, and as a data science group, we kind of help and at least initiate the start of helping the city kind of work through what open data means. So um, we're in GitHub, Good Knox Data. We basically have two portals right now, uh, kind of just using for the moment. So Open Data Knoxville um, uh, repo, I basically put in the notes uh, that was collected last Friday, uh, some, of the, some of the info, some of the stuff that we talked about, and some data sets of interest uh, that were kind of cool. Uh, and uh, and then as well, um, Chris Oshershoff, um I started putting together some notebooks, uh, Jupyter notebooks, uh, actually starting to play around with some of the data that's currently already somewhat available. Um, there'll be more information here soon. We're probably going to have a data sprint uh, in, in August uh, related to one of the data sets. We're still finalizing which one of those. Um, so stay tuned to uh, Meetup. Uh, we'll, have, we'll have Meetup dedicated some of those, and it'll start to be reoccurring. Um, well, uh, which, would, which would be really cool. Um, in addition, if you're, uh, we're also looking for speakers as well. So uh, this fall, if you're potentially interested in giving a talk on um, something that you're working on or you're interested in related to anything data science um, please let me know. Uh, get in touch. But uh, without any further ado, I will go ahead and switch it over here to Zach. Talk a little bit. Keep bringing questions in. Okay. Here we go. So actually we spend a lot of time talking about reinforcement learning before we talk about deep reinforcement learning. So, uh, get ready for the boring stuff first. And then we can get back to the first slide. Okay. Um, so what is reinforcement learning? Um, I think this quote pretty much sums up, uh, I guess I'll read it since it's a little one actually doesn't maybe read it all, but um, reinforcement learning is learning what to do, how to map situations to actions so as to maximize the numerical reward signal. The learner is not told which actions to take, but instead must discover which actions yield the most reward by trying. In the most interesting and challenging cases, actions may affect not only the immediate reward, but also the next situation, and through that all subsequent rewards. Um, so to compare that to like supervised learning, right, which a lot of people will probably see, either through regression or all the different forms of more advanced regression, so like logistic regression, um, everything else like neural networks, or just some form of supervised learning, right? Which is you give me an input, um, like a set of inputs, and I predict an output, right? Um, and you're trying to minimize some sort of loss that generally summarizes the difference between what you should have predicted and when you actually predicted. Um, reinforcement learning is actually sort of a more simple um, uh, like definition of just you have a state, right? You have some sort of state and environment, and you need to predict an action that will maximize the reward. Um, so it's a more general idea, actually, um, instead of sort of narrowly focused on function approximation. 
So, um, actually, let me just. So, the main things that I'm going to take out of this are so you're in a situation, the, the agent is in a situation um, and it's trying to maximize the reward. And it does that by observing the state, right? So, it takes observations from its environment and it uses an action that it thinks, that it calculates will yield the most rewards over time. So, there's also this idea of time. Um, but we'll start sort of more simply of like ignore time and different states and everything else. Um, I'll just look at that like, multi arm band. This is a really classic problem um, that actually dates from the like, 30s and 40s, I think, um, in terms of how you, if I have um, a, an environment. So, for instance, I have two slot machines, right? And they have an unknown payout. Um, I don't know if, which one's going to give me more money by me, you know, taking my time or putting in a coin. I don't know which one's more, more likely to yield more cash, right? Um, so, for instance, in this case, we have two different slot machines that both yield something that is normally distributed, right? With a mean of 0.5 and a variance of 0.4 versus a, a mean of 0.3 and a variance of 0.4. So, we, we know that now, right? Like we know that this one has a better expected value than this one. So I want to play this one. But if I walk into the situation for the first time and these you know, aren't on the wall, I have to figure out which one of these is going to give me more reward over the long run. Right? So the way you solve that, you could just go in and pull each lever, right? And maybe this one gives you um, 0.6 and this one gives you 0.7. And so you go, oh, actually, this one's lower, I'll just go for this one, right? But you'd actually be wrong, and so then you spend your next 100 turns or 100 coins pulling this lever and you wouldn't actually maximize. You could have gotten more from the other one. But you have to balance that with the fact that, so you could try them just randomly over and over again, right? And eventually you figure out that one's worth more than the other. So there's this delicate balance between exploration, right, where you're actually going out um, and just trying to find out things about the environment, right? Which one of these gives me a better return? And exploitation, which is, I know things about the environment, now I want to make money, I want to get reward, right? Um, and so you're trying to find the, the value by sort of exploring, but then exploit that value um, by using the things you know that works best. Um, and so, yeah, the value at any time is like your expected reward at that time, if you take a certain action. So you're trying to weigh which one of these two actions is higher value. Um, and so over the long run, you can balance these. So there's different, um, you know, different strategies. There's, there's a whole field of study that was devoted to this for decades, just this problem. Um, but one of the most basic ones is, you know, random. And one of the other ones is just do one each and then go whichever one seems better. Um, somewhere in between is something that's called epsilon greedy, which is just that, uh, for instance, for point one, Point one, so 10% of the time I do something random. The other 90% of the time I do whatever I think is the best, right? Whichever one in the past has given me the best rewards. Right? Um, and over time, you get better results by you know um, trying to explore a little bit, but also then take advantage of the ones that actually give you better results. Um, so that's sort of a basic, you know, we're looking at one time step, um, and we just have to make one decision. Um, so the, the, the full like reinforcement um, problem comes about when you are, are basically doing a Markov decision process. Um, and so these date to the 50s, and there was a bunch of different approaches to how you, you essentially solve them. Um, but reinforcement learning is I think, one of the better ways to solve them, but uh, basically what happens is you have a a, an environment, right, um, that has a certain number of states, and every time the agent acts on that state, the environment changes in some way that's stochastic. So you don't actually know for sure what will happen. So, um, for instance, you could be uh, in state zero, or the agent be in state zero, um, and it observes things about its action, its environment. It would take an action. Um, say action one, right? And that could lead to action two, 
Um, actually, sorry, in that case, it would definitely have trouble with my diagram here. Um, but the overall idea is that you um, are faced with a whole bunch of input from the environment. You use that to make a decision about which action to take, and then your action moves you to more information about the environment. Um, and so to solve this, you have to basically balance that exploration and exploitation, but you also have to associate actions with states. So you have to know, okay, well, when the environment looks this way, I should take this action. When it looks a different way, I'll take a different action. Um, and then you also have to sometimes do things that uh, have a low value in the current state, but might be valuable in the future. Um, and this makes more sense with an example. Um, so this is um, actually online as a, a game that you could play as an individual, or you can have um, an AI agent play. Uh, it's called Frozen Lake. And you know the, the way that this is set up is just that um, you start in as a, a game that you could play um, on a on a given square and. Um, you're trying to get to a reward here on the other side of the lake, right? So um, all these squares are frozen. The ones that are marked H are actually holes in the ice. So if you fall into a hole, you get minus one reward, the game ends. If you make it to the end, you get plus one reward, the game ends, right? Um, so it's not a very hard game, but for uh, an AI agent, you know, it's a little bit more difficult. So Especially because what we're seeing is a full representation. So I'll come back to that. But basically, you know, at each step, so each state, so my starting state is right here. I have the options of either going up, down, left, or right. Okay. So then I can move to another state, and then I once again can go up, down, left, or right. Um, so for instance, you know, if we were playing this, if we were in state four, three, so I'm just saying four and three. Like, what would be the best direction to go? Yeah. Right. You go right, <laughs> you get the reward. Okay. Um, but if you're in state like three, two, which is the best direction to go? Down? Right? Probably down. It's farther away from the game. So you have to evaluate that as well, um, which, so I kind of skipped over. You know, there is also, sometimes you try to go, say, right, and you actually go down. Like, sometimes the environment doesn't do what you actually want it to do, because there's a level of stochasticity. Um, basically, the ice is slippery, right? So sometimes you slide the wrong way. Um, but yeah, so for here, so, I mean, yeah, a couple of things there. So, so for here, obviously, the correct way is to go right. If I'm right here, that action is now a bad idea, right? So the, the correct action is based upon where you are on the board. I know this is like super mundane to us, but that's something that you have to be able to understand in order to navigate this. Um, and then the next thing we're going to talk about is, yeah, is this. If I'm right here, I know I don't want to go that way, but which is actually better about these two? Or, I mean, the same thing's kind of down here. So, um, the first thing that this presents a challenge of is associative learning, um, right? So um, I already talked about this, but basically, you know, the, the value of going down right here is one, right? Because I know I'm going to get a reward on the expected value. Um, I know that this is actually negative one. Um, I know that there's going to be a whole and the limit is zero. That number is going to be different somewhere else on the board. By the way, I'm, no, I'm like clapping through these. So, if anybody has like, you want to ask questions or anything? This, this can be much more, uh, you know, question and answer. I mean, what you get to board the squares there. So, if you have questions, for us. Uh, so, so this isn't really um, this AI algorithm it doesn't necessarily know. It's not directly trying to create a sequence. It's just trying to make decisions and figure out what the best decisions to make. As a, as a right, it's not board. going to do a set sequence. Um, in this case, it is memorizing this exact board, right? So it's right. not it's not generalizable enough that if this all goes somewhere else, it would get confused. And that's uh, sort of so the way that it's actually 
um, essentially visualizing, right? Like the, the way the data that it has about it is actually going to be a table, right? So this we have a, an environment that has 16 states, essentially. And these are actually um, so the, the table that represents it is actually going to have 16 sort of nested um, arrays, right? Where each one has four values. And so those four values tell me about the, the value of um, transitioning, you know, taking an action that transitions to different states. We start with like a zero, like all these are you know, zero, it doesn't know anything about the environment. Um, and if I move, right, so again, like I was saying earlier, uh, but if I end up down here and I go down, then this becomes a one, right? I now know that this is a, a trans a worth this action is worth the reward. Mm -hmm. Versus over here, it would also be one. But here, I saw this problem of I don't actually know what it's worth to go from this state to this state. So there's no reward here. Um, and so, in order to track that, um, we can actually use something uh, that's called a, the Bellman equation, um, which basically says, first off, you discount all your future rewards. So a reward now is still worth more than a reward um, 10 time steps in the future. Um, so that's that's why there's a, um, a actually that's the learning parameter, not it's not this um, But you can um, you want to discount future rewards by a certain amount, so like uh, they end up being exponentially discounted. Take uh, your like discount number. We send me to um, future value calculations. We take a discount number. So one thing, one time step in the future, something's worth you know, one. Two time steps in the future is worth uh, 0.85 times one. Three steps is 0.85 squared, etc. Um, so you discount the value voltage. How many steps in the future is it? Yeah, right. So this reward gets carried back right throughout, but it's going to be much less valuable up here on my first time step because I have all these intervening time steps. Um, but then the other part of it is how you actually propagate it back. So there's ways where you can do this where you let the whole thing run, you kind of let it go, and you take all the actions that happen right um, over that entire period, average them together. And say, okay, all together they shared in this reward, so they get a certain value. And then you run again, and you run again, and you run again. Um, it's very slow to converge. So that's kind of what we were doing, what I was talking about doing with the, um, the slot machine, right? You just try all the different levers, take the average return, that's how you learn which one's better, is the average. Um, but a faster way to do this is um, something that's called e learning, which is where you basically take at each step, you evaluate the value. Right, the quality of a given state and a given action. So, for instance, I could be right here, and I want to smoke a new number for this. Um, and so, to do that, I would look, I would basically choose the one that I think is the most valuable at that time, or maybe that's down, and then I would um, record the actual, like, what the value was for that new value, like for the new state. So that's the max, like the next state, and then look at what the, the um, best possible outcome would be in the next state. So basically, what you're doing is looking forward into the future based on what you currently know, which is not that great, but um, and trying to say, okay, the value of taking action A is is the best possible value that can happen after I take the value uh, action A, right? Mm -hmm. And then once you take action A, you're in a new state. You just do the same thing over and over and over again. So it just iterates, and you can pull the reward all the way back through. Um, so basically, uh, that's that's Q learning. It's like uh, 50 years of like reinforcement learning research in five slides, plus a bunch of other things they go into. But um, people haven't really so that basic idea had one like backgammon. Or one. 
had beaten humans at backgammon in the 90s, um, but hadn't really produced a whole lot of like really impressive um, wins. So like uh, Deep Blue we used a different um, technique of programming in the time. Um, but in 2015, um, they started using, or published in 2015, um, the combination of that Q now Q learning, right? That concept of that update um, with a bunch of advances in deep learning, right? Um, so basically, instead of using this table that says, "Hey, the next next state has this this value," you can now estimate that using um, a, a um, deep neural network, right? So um, basically, you're still estimating, "Hey, what is that max?" Potential value at the next state. Like, um, if I know what action I'm going to take, what, is, how much is going to help me the next step forward? Um, doing that with the deep, deep neural network causes some problems um, where it causes instability. It's kind of like um, trying to update itself at the same time as making decisions. Um, so there's other things you do where you have it basically replay its experiences. Um, and then you also delay updates. So there's some other little, you know, um, like black magic that's done um, in the deep learning part of it. Um, but it's basically the same, this, from a reinforcement learning perspective, it's the same idea. Um, and so, yeah, it plays video games. Uh, some of them much better than humans, others not so much. Um, but basically, it's, it's pretty interesting because what it's doing, so convolutional neural networks, um, Anybody's here for um, the last uh, talk here. Whenever neural networks, convolutional neural networks are um, based on the structure of um, neurons in like your occipital lobe, I guess. I don't know. And the not here to correct me. Where exactly what the like biological? It might be in the retina, but anyway, the biological uh, sort of inspiration for convolutional neural networks are. But they basically take a sort of sliding. Um, subset of an image, right? And so they allow, um, they, they can do image recognition, um, image processing and video processing much, much faster than, you know, regular neural networks, um, dense neural networks had done in the past. Um, because that's something that's called uh, like location invariance. So they can basically figure out that like, if they're playing Space Invaders, that it doesn't really matter if like, my guy's here and there's a rocket here, or my guy's here and there's a rocket here, those are still very similar overall um, because I'm about to get hit by a rocket or not. Um, so these work really well for understanding what's happening in Atari. So that's actually, you know, all you're doing is taking this really complex situation that's um, a video game, right? Um, and breaking it down into something that can be comprehended and then it's just doing the exact same thing that you know we could do with a table like you could do by hand with a table of just updating some values um, and so these really impressive they take millions of frames to learn so um, that's you know one of the things is it takes like 83 hundred hours of playtime or something for it to approach human um, skill and so then people are like well that's not really impressive because I can learn to play and you know, uh, like Breakout, which we're gonna look at, you could do pretty well in like two minutes. The first time you played it, you'd probably do okay. Um, but the reality is, every time it runs, it's actually learning to see. And then it's learning how to play Breakout. <laughs> it's learning to see by playing Breakout. So if you took like a baby, you know, an infant that couldn't see, and just said like all you get is Atari games, um, it's gonna take it a while to learn to see, and then to be able to play Atari games. Um, so overall, it's, it's relatively impressive um, progress. And so since then, there's been a bunch of different um, you know, sort of rapid development of both changes in how you present the environment to um, uh, the, the agent, um, though there's still a whole lot of focus on this like playing from pixels because it makes it very generalizable. So um, this algorithm can play any game, any of the Atari games. Some of them it's really bad at, but a lot of them it's quite good at. And it's the same algorithm, right? Um, but it's not truly generalizable because it's different training of every game. So each one, each little sort of agent learns how to play 
a specific game. So if it learns how to play Pong, <laughs> be very good at Pong. But when you have it play even like Breakout, which is a relatively similar game, it might be like move a bar, bounce a ball. It's not going to do it's going to be terrible, actually. Um, so it's better than a lot of stuff that's happened in the past because at least since it plays from pixels, you can use the same algorithm against a bunch of different problems. But you can't ever train something on one thing and then just transfer it somewhere else. Um, Question. Sure. Um, you said something like 8,300 hours to, is that? Uh, in terms of compute time, or is that some sort of estimate as if it were a human, like based on how many? Uh, yeah, it's, it's, only, to get, it's only like 80, 83 hours. So it's not that oh, okay. bad. Um, but it's, yeah, it's, it's like human play time. So um, for a uh, computer, I mean, it depends on how fast it's processing it, but some of this, you could do it in uh, like an hour. I mean, it depends on if you have like, a uh, research grade <laughs> GPU. Yeah. Um, so since then, there's also been some work um, because this kind of broad reinforcement running back to the fore. There's been a lot of work on like um, more complex ways of trying to do this part. Actually, of like how valuable is this action? Like all the things that are going on over here. Of just like I've got a bunch of input. Now I'm going to you know choose to do something else. Um, I didn't go want to go too much into this because it gets pretty complicated, but it, it's really around like um, a couple of different decisions in terms of like, do you both evaluate how valuable the situation is and make a choice about it at the same time? Um, and or some of them are just like, I'm not going to worry about how valuable an action is. I'm just going to worry about trying to figure out what the right action is to take. Like just skip the value part altogether and go straight to take the right actions. Um, which means you have to do some other things in terms of taking, you know, how you deal with uh, making a decision that's not useful in the current time step, but is very useful in the future. Um, so let's do some demos. All right, so the first of these is cart poll, which I guess will, well, show you what, what that looks like. Um, or that'll break. Okay, that's cool. Didn't need that. So we'll just go run it. Uh oh. Not the right stuff. <laughs> hey, man, there's no actual data on the screen. There's just. Uh, this is embarrassing. Uh, and I don't have this organized. Actually, it's in home somewhere. There we go. All right. So this um, is a little Python script that's built off of uh, TensorFlow and something called TensorForce. Um, so luckily, you know, there's a big, um, there's a lot of interest in uh, reinforcement learning now, and so people have sort of built a lot of libraries. So there's somewhere like instead of having to go plumb all of the you know, neural network architecture yourself, um, I guess plumb the plumbing, um, you can basically just specify like, hey, create a network that looks like this, um, and have it go play. So. Um, what we're doing here is basically setting up like an environment. Um, is this, can anybody read the text on here? Okay, and I'm not gonna, so we set up an environment and then we basically say, hey, this is the network that I want you to use to read that environment, look at that environment. And since this so environment- you can zoom in. Yeah, that's true. Uh, Let's just scroll through. There we go. Okay, so there's a bunch of boilerplate and me using, so. Um. Okay. Uh, yeah, there's a lot of cover stuff. Okay. Um. So yeah. So what we're doing here, basically saying, hey, I'm going to play this task cart poll, which is, and it'll throw a little monitor video here in a little bit, but basically, um, it's a physics task where there's a, a 
cart that has a pole on top of it, and you can pull it from falling over by moving the cart. You're like balancing a pole on top of a cart. Um, and um, um, I'm also going to monitor it, so it produces some videos that we can look at, and we're going to try and look at it as it runs. That may be a mess. It generally is hard to really follow. Um, but the way it's going to be sort of um, that input, which is you know the location of the cart. I don't know if there's like a velocity and then like the angle of the pole at the top and the angle of the bottom. You know, there's a few very there's maybe I think like four or six um, sort of numbers, right? The the size of the, the environment that it gets. It's just those numbers, um, and it's going to look at those with a pretty small neural network. Um, that you know only has like four neurons and another layer um, with eight neurons. Um, this is a very simple problem. So then, um, just saving stuff off for updating later. This is all stuff. So it's a VPG, which means it's a vanilla policy gradient, which means it's actually focused on not evaluating which action is the most valuable, but just which action do I take. So what's actually going to happen is this is going to go through and just do random stuff the first few times, right? And over time, like each time it's going to take, it's going to look at all the actions it takes, it took, rather, and um, assign them um, discounted rewards based on how long, uh, basically how long it's staying balanced. Um, so it basically gets a reward every time it's still balanced. Um, and then it's going to use the neural network to essentially try to decide um, a policy. Right? So each time the neural network is actually trying to guess, like, given this state, which action I should take. Not which action is most valuable, not how valuable is the action, but just like, exactly which one to take. Um, anyway, so then there's a bunch of stuff around the optimizer. So this is all just stuff about like how the neural network is set up. Um, this is stuff that's just printing things if we uh, as it runs. So we're gonna try and run this. Hopefully, I'm not gonna get some sort of weird problem with the fact that this is displaying on two screens. There we go. So there it is, and you can see that it learns very fast. <laughs> um, so it keeps. Basically, every time it, re it, it goes too far, it resets. Um, so you never really get to see it like totally just like fall off. It, you, know, you don't get to see the true full failure. Um, but yeah, so it's just trying over and over and over again. Um, and so like right now, it's run um, 700 episodes into 800. It's not doing too hot. So like it's got a reward of 67. Um, which is not that great. Uh, this is normally considered like um, solved when you can consistently get to around like 200, I think, um, a reward of 200. Online, if you go look at that like leaderboard, so to compare, you know, how my how I'm doing. Uh, actually, good. Oh, well, still there. Hopefully, yeah. So here's somebody who solved it in 85 episodes. It's pretty good. That's probably cheating. Um, <laughs> let's see where we are now. So we're getting to 155. That's a lot better. Let's see if I this is. You can see it's we're really sped up, but it's sort of staying upright longer, right? Um, and we can actually go monitor this by yo. Um, let's see. Let's see if I hopefully, put this. Oh. So, is something always causing it to tip as opposed to like what if it just stood still? Yeah, so it starts with some other, um, like a random initial sort of, uh, yeah, velocity. So it, it, if you don't put any input in, it will fall over. Um, so let's see. So we can watch 
So this is after, this is like its first try. Um, so yeah, it's an actual MPEG. So you can see, it's. I know cart hole is a little hard to tell, but like it's failing really quickly. Because it stops it before it really gets like way down. Um, but then if you look at like one of the most recent episodes that it played, it's doing pretty well, right? Like it's keeping it really straight. Um, I mean, it's. I guess it's also just a hard problem. Yeah. So every hundred episodes, it's saving one of these, um, so that we can look at it. Which yeah. Um, all right. So we can. We'll just assume. I don't know if I put a max on this train, but we're at, now at one ninety five. Um, so we're kind of getting to the upper limits of what it what it can do. Um, so that's one. Um, this other one that I have is breakout, which I did not link correctly. This is all a gym that open. Mhm. Um, breakout. Yeah. So this is breakout. Um, if you haven't played it. On an Atari 2600. Um, so this, they have it right now. This is a random agent, so it's just moving around randomly. So we're going to try and do better than that. It's important. Um, and so I didn't actually. I'm not going to run this one live. This took. Uh, well, I guess we can see from my when these were created. Uh, well, but I think it took like three or four hours for this one. Um, all in CPU, um, which this is trained with something called PPO, uh, which is pretty new, like hot stuff that OpenAI published last year. It's what they're using to play Dota games, um, which I'll have a plug for at the end of this about how we should all go watch some Dota games. Um, it generally does pretty well on CPU. It's also a lot of these have become, um, they do them asynchronously, so that's why. I have um, like seven folders here, is because I actually created, or eight folders rather, um, eight worker agents for each one of my CPU cores, and then, um, not workers, but explorers, agents, so each one's sort of independent, right, and it's trying its, its own uh, luck on the environment, and then after a set number of episodes, so I don't think it was like 64, but it comes back and they share um, information about the environment, the neural networks, the parameters are all sort of brought closer to each other, and they go back out and do their own thing, and then come back. So you, first, it's a way to do things in parallel, um, but it also actually yields better results overall than just having one agent that goes really fast. Um, you're less likely to get like stuck in local optima, or yeah, local optimum, optima, did I say, I don't know if I started that plural or singular, but anyway. Um, you're less likely to get stuck. You're also less likely to do stuff like um, burn in, where like you can do things that aren't even local optimums, um, but they're still like the agent just learns to do things the wrong way, basically. Um, uh, it's more just like not having a good way to. Uh, yeah, so it's like if you do things random, there, at some point it got far enough along that it did get a random reward afterwards, even though it did the wrong way. And then it stuck doing the thing from the wrong at the beginning, and then it just keeps doing that part. It's stuck in a local optimum, gets a hill. Yeah, I mean, it gets a little bit of a hill. It learns it. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Pretty much. Yeah, I, so I'll talk a little bit more about the theoretical. Yeah, really. Yes. <laughs> exactly. Um, so this is this is his first try at breakout. I got one point, and he got two. So it didn't do too high. Um, and so then we can see like you know uh, five hundred episodes for this one, which means that there's you know been like four thousand total across all of them. It's starting to get the game pretty well, right? Like, got a pretty good understanding.
Um, I don't know for sure at this point, but it might also be doing overall better at this point than humans do. Or like an expert human. They always have in all these papers, they're always like the human baseline and such and such. Or like, you know, and we had a, an expert human play this game for like three hours to practice, and then we gave them, you know, 100 tries. And I always wonder, like, who is the, the expert human, human that they bring in? And it's like, yeah, I know how to play Atari really well. Yeah. Anybody with 10,000 hours of breakout experience. Um, so one of the parameters, here, like it, it obviously knows what like, the ball is, the velocity. No, no. It's it's what it's that. It's all from pixels. There's ones from RAM. I don't know much about those. Uh, with that, the learning the convolution neural networks is a uh, learning a lot for transfer style learning for just picking up on the images. No, I mean, so they people have tried. Yeah, it should. Like that's absolutely theoretically where it it's needs not to go. a popular idea, but theoretically, it's um, possible. they've tried to do it within the Atari learning environment between games by trying to like keep the convolution or cut off like you know one or two layers, um, and it yeah now it's. Owning. I don't know if this one, one of them I watched, it gets like stuck in a loop at some point, don't, but um, yeah, it's clearly where things need to go. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit more about like, I guess, my, you know, bullshit theories on where this field is now and like how it needs to improve. Um, as soon as this wins, come on, do it. Oh, here we go. Yeah. So <laughs> it's stuck. It's too consistent in its actions, and so it just. <laughs> I don't know if it's going to come out of this. So maybe this is what you're going to get into, but like, generally speaking, is it better for more deterministic um, kind of games like these, where the ball is always going to react the same way to your movement? Uh, so, let's, so let's say our play, for instance. I imagine like velocity and its position determines whether it's how far over it's going to fall. Far is, I think there's still there's, so once you add in like a random factor, it still has some random. It's not able to completely observe the environment. There is it's still a stochastic environment. This I guess is technically not, except that what it's actually seeing is a bunch of like it only sees some of the pixels. Um, there's a lot of like flashing apparently in Atari pixels, um, and it's repeating every time it makes an, an action it repeats it for four pixels. So it actually does have a little bit of Grit thrown in, um, and then this I assume is deterministic, but there could be other stuff in Atari that's not, um, right? I mean, even that at that point you could still handle with some amount of randomization. Gonna, All right, this is probably going to go on forever, but this is, I mean, this is, so this is part of the fun of this is like, what funny things will like an AI agent do when it? I guess your uh, it's cornered. Algorithm has like a, a limitation on like it finally gives up. And um, yeah, so there's a maximum episodes, um, and then there's also like no ops you put in stuff. So if it doesn't, if it just stops doing anything, then you, you uh, kill the episode. Um, this one also has a special, so like breakout only actually has really two actions left and right. Um, the fire button just starts the game. So there's some standardization they do where like this game just, uh, it automatically pushes fire at the start. It like starts the game without the agent doing it. Otherwise, it takes a long time to figure out that like, oh, you have to push start at the beginning. <laughs> yeah. And that only does something at the beginning. Yeah. And the rest of the time it doesn't, yeah, it doesn't matter. So let's see if this one gets any better, does any better. Eh. Or if it's also going to get stuck. Or maybe run out lives. Oh. <laughs> Yeah, I guess it either did. I, sometimes this also doesn't record quite right. So. Um, okay, so back to presentation. So, what's cool about these? And then I'll skip stuff that I've already said. Demos. So, Apparently, you can't learn LibreOffice and Press. Okay, so um, 
the first thing is like for somebody so I'm you know my background is in um, statistics and then like predictive analytics, machine learning, data science, right? And it's all you never really like you build an algorithm that solves one small part of the problem and then you figure out how to use that information in some other way and you have to worry about retraining, you have to re you just end up doing a whole bunch of stuff outside of it because all you can actually do with with supervised learning is like either classify things or regress things. Um, at the end of the day, that's all that there is actually going on. Um, you're, you know, it's, it is just a function of approximation. Um, so reinforcement learning is really cool because you can actually solve, you can go out and say like, this is what I need to happen and you can get something that will, you know, theoretically do that entire, um, like, pipeline for you. And I don't, that's, it's a little bit hypey, that's not entirely true. Um, but the point is it gets you closer to like, take an action, right? Like it figures out what action to take instead of just like saying, you should probably take this action. Or if you took this action, this will occur, right? Um, which makes it, to me, like deeper, deep learning. So if you go back to this slide, these like convolutional neural networks are a really big deal. And really all neural networks are a big deal because they do um, their own feature encoding, right? So you don't, have to go out and figure out like how do I make an image? Like what do I say about an image that, that makes sense, right? It's like, no, just use convolutional neural networks, they'll figure out edge detection, they'll figure out basic shapes, and they'll work everything up from that, right? And you can use that same thing. It's been used obviously a lot on like speech. Um, and then just regular old dense neural networks pick up all sorts of weird nonlinearity so that you can take something that's um, you know, you just don't have to do all the feature engineering. So you don't have to go look at a, a, a history of somebody's, you know, orders and then say like, okay, well, what's that average time between orders and what's like the different, um, you know, categories of orders and all that other stuff and make it into some nice, really pretty vector. You still have to do some of that, but um, it, basically it pushes the learning farther towards the data set, right? So like there's less human work on the front side of going into a predictive algorithm. Um, to me, reinforcement learning pushes it the other direction, right? So there's less human involvement on the output of that sort of understanding of the environment. Um, and so what that does is, you know, in the same way that you don't have to do a whole bunch of extra feature encoding, it also means that you can um, be less reliant on labeling, right? Um, or at least it gives you a new kind of labeling task. Because instead of having to actually have specific labels, you just have to have a good reward signal. Um, talk a little bit about reward signals, but um, overall, that's that's a little easier. So, and this is where there has not been a whole lot of research. Um, you know, there's been someone trans, um, transfer learning between different reinforcement learning um, like trained agents. Um, but the reality is, once again, like this thing learns how to see edges, right, in order to see things in Atari. Um, it should be able to see edges other places. You could do something, so I mean, a, a simple, like Google already uses um, reinforcement learning to teach a whole bunch of like robots how to pick up objects, right? And it's easy because you can, you can automate supervising because you basically say like, I have a sensor and when you place the object into the bucket, the sensor goes off, you get a reward, right? You don't have to have somebody saying like, oh, they dropped it correctly, they did this, no, just, get it in the bucket, that's it. We can put 100 of those in a room and they can run 24 hours a day and you get huge amounts of training data because you're just, you've automated the reward signal. Um, and so that's, it's learning, you know, what is correct movement for a pincer or for like a hand, you know, for a grasper. It's learning these really complex little things um, just based on like bucket. <laughs> yes, I did bucket. Um, and you could do the same thing for vision, you could go like, Throw a bunch of things in the grass and have a little robot, you know, like scoot around and like be like, is this, you know, a red ball or a green ball? Okay, it's a red ball. So if you drop the red ball back somewhere else, you get a reward. I mean, that's, you know, we don't need more labeled images probably, but. Um, and then, so yeah, so there's generalized algorithms like that talks about. There's these algorithms that work on a whole lot of different problems. Um, they don't, they're not specific. 
to video games even. So like the stuff that's working across a whole bunch of Atari games will also work on like um, you know, to some degree self-driving cars, um, a lot of like industrial control situations. I mean, not maybe not the convolutional neural network part, but the actual underlying deep like the actual underlying reinforcement learning, particularly some of the stuff that's come up, thing sort of come up because of Atari can be used in other situations. Um, it also learns from simulation. So if you have a good simulation of any sort of environment, you can go have something learn entirely about it without ever actually touching the real world. Um, which some people have very good simulations. But once again, you know, talk about like industrial control, that's already a whole field of study and operations research where they have really good simulations of everything they do. Um, I mean, I'm sure like aerospace is similar. So, um, and then it can deal with non, you know, uh, non-stationarity automatically. Not automatically, but it can figure out, so you don't have, once again, you don't have to do stuff like retraining necessarily, um, but it's a little bit complex. Um, and so like I said, yeah, um, it's actually being used in machine learning, like AutoML, which is a Google product, actually uses re uh, reinforcement learning to learn about how to optimize the hyperparameters of deep learning huh. algorithms. Um, and machine learning to help learn. Exactly. Yeah, yeah it's uh, pretty incepted, I guess. And then text summarization. Salesforce did a thing with it um, where they were coming up with text summaries, and basically, uh, the idea was, you know, they'd get a paragraph and um, it would summarize that paragraph in two sentences, right? And then somebody would just grade it, right? So there wasn't like, this is what the summary should look like, right? This is a correct summary, this is a wrong summary. They just would have it run and generate a bunch of samples and then somebody would come back and be like, that's pretty good, that's crap, that's good, right? Which, once again, there's still a human involved, but you've changed. In this case, it really just makes it easier for the algorithm to pick up. Um, and it's easier, actually. You can grade a whole lot of summaries much faster than you can produce uh, summaries. But um, so it changes it. Um, so it's. Um, I know it's been used. Google uses it for um, cooling in um, data centers. So there's just a little agent that determines, like you know, what vents are open and what's running. Um, Bonsai is a startup. Um, that just got bought by Microsoft that claims that they can do this for all kinds of stuff. But I don't know. Question for you. Um, how much are, like, for example, with edge detection, would you use like a, an edge detection neural net or like a, config, a pre configured neural net for that? Or, um, or, or are these things always, do they always learn from scratch? They always learn from scratch. That's how people have been using them. So that's that is that's why that's like the big thing is if you weren't learning from scratch all the time, uh, it probably could learn other things much faster. But the problem is, um, you know, how do you when they try to they they don't we're teaching them from scratch over and over again because otherwise they don't really know how to do anything else. Like that's the only thing that's been created so far is to learn from scratch. Um, which is really a limitation in deep learning, I think, not in reinforcement learning. Um, but OK, so yeah, so limitations. So there's a lot of hype. Um, it is really cool. I think reinforcement learning is like one of those things that's fundamentally going to produce good stuff. Um, so, but still, it's not general intelligence. I mean, I kind of covered that. But like, you know, they're general use algorithms. But once they're trained, they do the same thing every time. Um, there is. A, a general video game AI challenge that people try to do that's like come up with one agent that trains um, and then they play it on like 10 random games. Like you know that there's, you know, there's 200 games and you can train it on um, some set of them and then they pick 10 ones that it's never seen before. Um, and then, you know, on top of that, they're kind of inefficient, although part of that, like it says, because they're training from scratch, right? It takes 83 hours to learn how to play a game that a human can play in a minute. Um, and then they're overfit. Um, there's a lot of things about how they end up overfitting. I mean, there is no validation set in these. There's a certain amount of like, if it's with, if it's a stochastic environment, you know, they're not always seeing exactly the same thing each time, but we don't, there's not really validation 
in um, reinforcement learning, like test sets, like there are in um, you know, supervised learning. Um, it's often outperformed by specific algorithms. So, like, I think you could probably find a control theory algorithm that does. It might even be the ones that are saying the leaderboard for cart poll um, that are actually, you know, like know what the dynamics of the system are in terms of like, you know, how it's using some sort of Newtonian physics or whatever, and they'll destroy the. Um, reinforcement learning algorithms in terms of the speed that they solve the situation because they know exactly what it is. Um, and then they're de dependent on all this whole idea of feature embedding, right, of using like convolutional neural networks. Um, so that means that they're basically chained to deep learning. So, um, you know, if deep learning doesn't continue to get better, then reinforcement learning won't necessarily either. At least not deep reinforcement learning. Um, they still need good reward functions, so that's where it seems like, hey, you can do this easy stuff with rewards. It makes it much easier than having to label thousands and thousands of images or like situations in complex environments. Um, but it's actually really hard to do correctly. So if you have too few rewards, then when the agent first starts out and it just acts randomly, it doesn't um, get enough feedback, right? Because it never got a reward. So it just keeps going. So like Montezuma's Revenge is one of the target games is really hard because you actually have to like do complex actions before you get any reward. Breakout, you have a decent chance of getting at least like one point or two points just by you know pushing start. Um, but if you build in too many rewards into an environment, you can get stuff like this. So reward shaping means that you add extra rewards into the environment. Um, or like if you have a simulation or something. So even though you're actually only interested in those very last outcome, um, so for instance in this, you want this boat to race. And you want it to get the best time possible on the racetrack. But they built in rewards where they gave it, um, they gave it rewards for picking up power-ups along the way. And it figured that out. And... Oh, why am I looking up there? Weird. So yeah, it was like, oh, power-ups are worth points too. But you also can't drive a boat very well. So that's the <laughs> thing. You didn't even really yeah. figure out how to drive a boat that well, and then it just figured this one out. Well, Which anybody just... who's farmed a lot of stuff, particularly in maybe like a game where you didn't really pay attention, you're just like farming while you were you on. You also give it a little bit of a. Uh... Punishment for like running into things and stuff, right? Yeah. 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 So you start getting running into multi objective optimization. I've done it outside of this uh, where I'm optimizing like chemical reaction rates for networks. And then once you start giving multi objectives, that algorithm will be really smart about maximizing the score, but giving you nothing close to what you want. So you can always try and add another objective. You will be amazed about how these algorithms. Outsmart you. Yep. You find a way to the best numbers, but nothing. There's a huge uh, number of uh, examples online of, yeah, exactly that. Of, of, I think I called it exploiting, maybe. Um, but, I mean, but the thing is, humans do this shit all the time. Like, <laughs> local optimum, yeah. exploiting the reward because you don't understand what the actual reward is. Like, that's. Part of how learning works, like there's there's you know stuff online where the you know something learns to walk, it's supposed to like run, and instead it just flips on its back, kind of like uh, back flips along on the ground. Well, it's still moving forward, <laughs> and how does it know that that's not? There's like no baseline to compare it to, and if you look at human, um, you know even high levels of human performance, we do that all the time as a species, like the Fosbury flop, right? Of like. People used to do high jumps forward, and one guy came along and was like, wait, I can do this backwards, and he did way better than everybody else. He, he like got gold in the Olympics, and then by the next Olympics, he wasn't even competitive, because everybody else just copied his technique, and were actually a better athlete. So like, yeah. to me, those, those limitations are something that show that we're actually, it's not that we're like doing it wrong, it's just that there's very, you know, these are small, small little brains. <laughs> That we're trying to ask to do pretty complex things without any knowledge of the world, basically. Yeah. Um, anyway, so those are yeah some of the limitations and. I mentioned Montezuma's Revenge. I think they got some out of it. They do. Keep that name down. So it doesn't have very good intermediate reward. 
PPO, I think, will do it. So one that I am using um, is uh, something that's just it's deep, deep Q learning, so it's that same sort of not great, but pretty good algorithm um, but with um, demonstrations. So you can actually give it some uh, you know, expert demonstration of how to solve. Right, and then it'll use those, and then actually, but it's not transfer learning because it doesn't just try to copy them. It learns from those and then starts executing those better and better than the, the starting examples. Um, but it'll solve Momsuma's revenge because it already knows enough to get it to a reward. Um, so yeah, if you actually, if you want to like learn more about all this stuff, um, if you want to start running these, um, you know, having somebody else play video games for you. Video games are hard. Um, you can, you know, this is sort of in order of how deep you want to go, but um, there's some simple tutorials um, online. This guy has a medium that I think are pretty good. Um, you may notice I've built some of the material. Um, there's sort of the textbook, um, which I overwrote part of it. Sutton and Barto. Um, Reinforcement Learning and Introduction. There's actually, they wrote it in 1998. It hadn't really been updated until like late last year. Um, but there is a free PDF text, like the second Google image or Google result, um, that's a draft from late last year. So I think they just want it to be out there. Um, David Silver, who's at Google DeepMind and the University of College London, has like his entire course for his introductory class, um, just on YouTube. He has all the slides up and everything. Um, pretty good. And then there's a bunch of things like this out there, but um, this one, it's in PyTorch, so I haven't actually um, used it, because uh, I do TensorFlow. I haven't learned PyTorch. Anyway, um, but it looks like a really good idea. It's basically like all of these recent papers, like big papers, uh, Implement it, right? So you can go through, you can read the paper, and you can see somebody how, how somebody actually wrote the code. Um, and then, you know, obviously, if you want to get even further, then the next thing to do is just start reading the papers and implementing the code yourself. Um, and I didn't, I guess I did not say it correctly, but overall, like, um, you know, you can train on uh, video games. If you if you were thinking about using this for like actual implementation in like a work environment or something, you need Simulation, um, at least unless you're, some of these have gotten much better, but I would I would say simulation because nothing ever trains fast enough for me. Um, and then you need, um, like, in addition to that, it has to be a process that's, it'd be okay if you just did everything randomly. Or you have to set some guidelines such that you're, uh, Making it okay so that within those guidelines you can do everything randomly, right? Like you have to have guardrails um, because they do weird stuff, right? Um, yeah. But there are some situations where that's still, um, you know, it's still really useful. Um, anyway, any questions? So is just. No. <laughs> Um, yeah, so our goal is to um, basically send, to use these for essentially content creation. Um, so, like content recommendation systems um, and some other things around like when you deliver content. Um, which luckily is one of the things where like random isn't that bad. Like <laughs> nobody's gonna get killed, right? Um, although these are the things that are driving self-driving cars. If you have enough money, I guess you can get it good enough before you put it out into the real world. Um, yeah. So reinforcement learning is that basically what um, is it all based on? You know, back propagation neural networks. There a difference in the two, or is there a you know, how, um, is it broader, or is it, you know, is it separate? So these are combining both of them. Like deep reinforcement learning, you know, 
everything up to here. Actually, this whole picture, really, because there, there's a bunch of stuff that happens on this. This is all supervised learning. Um, it's all machine learning. Um, the like the stuff we're talking about at the beginning, which is which is what's actually happening after all this, the way that you how you evaluate um, values of different actions and how you set policies and how you iterate those over time and discount feature doors, all that is not machine learning. I, based on my, uh, it's not function approximation, so it's not machine learning. Um, yeah, but it's, it's, so it's a different, I mean, it's, it's sort of the same way that like unsupervised learning really is a very different, like the way you do unsupervised learning is not really related to the way that you do um, Supervised learning. So. so, would you say it's kind of a particular way of using, you know, neural network? Or this part, yeah, this part is yeah. strategy of, you know, the employing or yeah, yeah, they're using neural networks for one part of like the reinforcement learning uh, um, problem. Um. I mean, you see that a lot. So, like, even I'm sure I'm trying to think of specific examples, but there's definitely stuff that does like you unsupervised learning and you use um, I mean, a basic one. If anybody's uh, familiar with like principal component analysis or any sort of like dimensional reduction, you could do that, which is technically I means it's often used for machine learning for supervised problems. You can then do that and then do unsupervised learning. I'm sure there's some weird stuff that does like textual analysis where they you could use gloves so like glove you could do glove which has machine learning within it to come up with a an, an encoding of um, words right like uh, it's a natural language processing technique and then you could do unsupervised learning on top of it so there's a lot of this like let's go use machine learning for this little part of something but it's within a broader field. That also happens to have learning in the name. So, a uh, hyperparameter optimization deep tuning network, such as you know network topology, which filters you're using, how does that work with reinforcement learning? Where does it get its like? How do you help select the better features there? The better or the better hyperparameter. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, so, so you can you, find. You, are you just using like, hey, this is a standard layout that comes with package, and we're going to just let it. Pretty well, much. Okay. Um, there's some things. I mean, there's some. So there's some basics around like if you actually have a well-defined um, feature um, vector. So like for that carpool one, right? I was using four eight four. Okay, basically. so there's some highly researched four things behind that, that people are these are pretty much well, to the well understood. I know I have four actions coming in. I want some amount of nonlinearity. And I know I have four actions going out. So there's actually, this will automatically have four after this. That's the last fully connected layer that's softening. So um, there's a there's some rules around it. But yeah, it's, um, I don't know. I'm sure there's, there's, I think saying it's black magic is somewhat like, or voodoo or whatever is somewhat uh, a cop out that I hear a lot. Um, but I have no idea, it's, and I don't think very many people have a good idea about how to do hyperparameter optimization. That's part of the reason that you know Google's throwing <laughs> machine learning at it. Um, but those, so that's just an example of um, uh, Google's AI stuff, and, and then they open open image and the function that came from. Yeah, so you download it from that website. So TensorFlow and all this TensorFlow stuff. So technically, what this is, this is TensorForce, which is a library that's built by some guys at Cambridge, um, and it's implementing all the stuff behind the scenes in TensorFlow, um, and then it's playing, yeah, uh, OpenAI, which is Elon Musk's like AI is going to ruin the world, so I'll make a foundation. That promotes AI, yeah. um, but they do cool stuff. So you know, thanks, Elon. Um, anyway, so it's playing the OpenAI gym, um, which has 
I don't know how many different because it has both it has physics, like really basic physics challenges. It has all the Atari challenges, and then it has Go um, Go, which is like a physics, a more complex physics um, challenge. But where do you like set the network specification there? Yeah, I mean the amazing thing to me is you can just add more network layers and layers of networks. Yeah, anywhere. Sizes. It's really a simple text description. Not not a lot of code. Nope. And so you get totally different network structures, just mm -hmm. depending on how you set it up. So um, uh, I guess I read lately uh, somebody was getting into uh, making. Networks of networks, so they're like cell networks, I guess. Mm -hmm. So you have a bunch of little networks; they're all connected with as a bigger network, and mm -hmm. they can learn specialized things. Yeah, and I'm not sure how they how they link them up, but it's not even much more complicated. Mm -hmm. If you're talking about the supervised machine learning, what they do is they'll individually train each of those, and then they'll take another external data set and feed all the outputs of the data of the neural networks into a new neural network that does its own supervised machine learning. So you have to have an extra holdout data set because you're just doing an extra round of machine learning, and the outputs of the original neural networks actually be features for the next round. Yeah. So the cell network is a different st structure, different than that. Yeah. So you you still do sample data. And then new data and teach it different. Yeah, from what I understand, like that's just a basic ensemble learning. They're they're, they're playing around with those like crazy, but from what okay. I understand, it's all variations. And then you can tune the like relu. There, there's different functions inside that do the calculate the actual calculations. You can tune those to like relu as well, and that's just a uh, real basic uh, rectified linear unit. Rectified yeah. Linear. So yeah. Yeah. I don't want to change things off of. Prelude, because it's, I don't know why, but that's what's been really fun. Do you have the code that. where you define your uh, reward? No, so I don't define, so that's the environment is defining it. Okay. Um, is there a way to feed it a custom reward? So you would have to um, redefine the environment. Okay. You can, I, so I don't know for sure, but so, because I, I haven't played with it, but OpenAI, um, has something that's called Universe, where you can actually have it play like almost any game that'll play on like Windows. Maybe it's just on Unix, but it'll play a whole bunch of games. Mm -hmm. um, like they have like two thousand okay. games. You know? and I think that part of that is there's also a way that it lets you do reward shaping. Like it has some it has its own built-in libraries for. But, so an environment has like a set. Um, set of parameters, including the, the nodes and stuff. Uh, it has its own. Normally, you're, there's no real parameters to it, right? Like I'm, it's because you want these to be sort of like benchmarks. Um, so there's, you know, there's, you know, so there's like version zero and version four. So there's some weird little things that they change between them, um, but they're they want to be the same because you want researchers to be able to. Say how well they did on something, and it'd be exactly the same as the last guy that did it. Right. But what exactly makes up an, an environment? In this case? The, I mean, it's, it's like a game. It's a Markov right? decision like, process. How do you connect the neural network to like, or whatever you're simulating? So that's totally separate from. So yeah, that's. That's like some code. Yeah. Like no, that's so this right here. I'm just saying, hey, this is the environment. I could do whatever here. This is totally separate from from this, right? I just have said this is what the, I'm going to create. I could go in here and say, you know what? Don't play cart pull, play uh, breakout, or I don't know what the I mean, pong is easy because it's. I'm probably going to spell it wrong. Whatever it's, but I can just have it run something else, and it'll use the exact same neural network and everything. It's going to fail terribly because it's trying to use. This yeah. little tiny dense neural network on like pixels, but it, it, it probably will throw an error. No, yeah, but the uh, it might just. But these but, but the AI gym, they they've got like hooks to get like the points from the game into. The, yeah, that yeah. Yeah. from so the gym ID. I mean, that's an identifier where for an environment, correct? Yeah. So and where where is all that? Actually, so I won't redefine. Hopefully, if I ran this, let's see, and still exist. Yeah. So, 
There's. Actually, wait. That's not the right. Okay. Is it doing? Is it actually reading the screen to get the points, or is it? No, no. Sorry, it is getting it is getting fed um, the rewards itself. Yeah, it looks like cart pull is getting all numeric value. So let's so. Um, all right. So in let's see what I don't remember all of the. Um, so it's hard. I can't. I don't think I can make the console bigger. But so I say like imp dot actions, right? And it says like there's two actions, both integer, right? Um, and let's see. I'm trying to remember what the. So imp dot execute. Hopefully it'll tell me what I'm actually supposed to put in. I could actually play cart ball right here <laughs> from an interpretive console. Um, interact with the execute. Let's just see what it's gonna. It's gonna hopefully tell me exact, or I'm gonna spell it wrong. All right. Um. So I will say one one, and I'll put an extra comma. Uh, it's a single. Okay. So that did something. I'm not sure why it's popping up. Um, and I haven't reset it. Sorry. Normally you're not. Yeah. Uh, but it'll. But when I so when I reset, yeah. So first, that's going to tell me there. So this is what's on the game. This array of like. I don't know what these actually are. An angle and positioning of different things. Um, and then every time I act, if I execute one, it's going to give me the new. It's going to say, okay, this is the state. Okay. It's not terminated, and you got a reward of one. So it was in a state, you did an action, and then that's the result. Okay. And, and, and part of that state. result that you get back tells you the reward. Right. Okay. And if it's terminal, right? Okay, let me plug one thing. So if you think this stuff's cool, um, I'm not going to like play the video, but you should go home and watch um, OpenAI 5 and uh, watch their video on it. But uh, OpenAI has trained um, five independent agents to play Dota, which I don't know if people know Dota, but it's a very highly competitive video game, much like League of Legends. It's the harder version of League of Legends. Um, and it beats humans easily, like normal humans. They're going to go have it play a whole bunch of professional players, like the best in the world, um, in uh, like a week, sure. um, and hopefully we're gonna have like a viewing party for that. We're all super <laughs> nerdy people. Um, I'm really excited about this. I mean, they even say like they personally didn't think this was really possible with the current technology. Um, it's it's something else. Um, it's the degree of uh, like depth of understanding, but part of this is they are getting because the game outputs um, it already has like a bot API that's made for writing rules based bots, right? Um, so it's not playing from pixels, so it gets to play from you know it's not cheating. It doesn't see things that humans wouldn't see, but everything's already a nice you know vector that knows all these different you know where things are. It's getting all the health in terms of you know um, scalar numbers and stuff. So Given that little hand, you know, advantage, um, it's able to figure out really, really deep strategies and play as like five independent individuals, um, and still like do teamwork and everything. Yeah, you so, didn't mention like AlphaGo or uh, <laughs> AlphaZero, right? So AlphaZero learns from scratch, and and uh, basically the growth function is you win, right? But with enough reinforcement, it builds up this. You know, it builds its own reward map, I guess. Say, this is a good strategy to follow. So there's layers and layers up to get to the win. Yeah. Yeah. So you don't even have to tune it yourself, really. It just tunes itself. I mean, it learns. That's the point. Right? Yeah, I'm sure there's still a whole lot of hyperparameter guesswork that went into both AlphaGo and then AlphaZero. Yeah. 
um, and, a, and millions of dollars of compute. That's what I mean. This, I think, I figured out they're spinning. I like this also because they tell you everything about what they were doing. I mean, it's not. Hopefully, they'll write a paper that's more in depth. But like, I was calculating their like their cloud bill on some of this, and like I think they're spending. I can't remember what I counted. Um, ten thousand dollars a day or something. Maybe twenty thousand dollars a day. Maybe they do this. But did you? So, uh, but yeah, I guess I wonder if they have. Did they talk about special reward shaping they had to give it? Mm -hmm. Do they? Just kind of they talked a little bit about some, but yeah, they gave some basic rewards of like, you know, attacking creeps is good. Um, like, don't maybe don't take damage. I don't know, but there's there were some rewards. What are, what are the degrees of freedom in terms of the the play, right? So like, you know, in the in the examples that we were doing, you can move left or right. Right. You know, it's just those two moves. What is what is in this? Yeah, it's nuts. Um, they give an example here of um, so if I click, let's see, I'm not totally familiar with this. So, defending base, maybe then same input you use when you play. So, yes, yeah, I mean, so is it a keyboard? Is it so I am side? right yes, now. And it, so I have, I can do nothing, I can attack, which then allows me to select all these different potential attack points. So I can attack like this or this or this, and I can attack in like a whole grid around it potentially, right? Um, so there's, I don't remember, like 40,000 or something? Um, they say somewhere in here. Yes. Um, 20,000, so it views the world as a, a vector of 20,000 numbers and then takes an action by emitting a list of eight enumeration values, um, each of which then has a whole bunch of separate. So, you know, it takes one of these, but then some of these have uh, a couple hundred values underneath them. Or, you know, so it's, and it's doing that every uh, 30 milliseconds or something. So that's part of the reason it's also better than humans. This goes back to the whole, like, Watson... Playing at Jeopardy. Every time Watson knew the answer, Watson won the ring. Computer, like, <laughs> there's no la the latency is much lower than a human, and so these, you know, they have a basically a reaction speed of 30 milliseconds. Humans is like, humans is 200, 300, somewhere in there. So there's a little bit of, you know, unfair advantage. Maybe. But yeah, it knows what to do. It you to the right. Yeah, so something that like each 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 agent played like almost 100 years equivalent. Yeah. Wow. No, no, no. They really know their Dota. But to be fair, like this is a really deep game. I know, maybe maybe think Go is more, but like they interview. Um, I don't remember who it was Blizzard or Mini. They interview some like pro who's now a commentator, and he's like, "Yeah, it took me like 10 years to figure out this guy." So, you know, only off by an order of magnitude. Okay, get, get some beer.